On behalf of the Global Environmental Change Section, I will welcome you to this seventh annual Tyndall Lecture that was established to provide a historical perspective on global environmental change. The lecture is named in honor of John Tyndall, a 19th century Irish physicist and mathematician who was skilled in many areas of inquiry. Among his most important discoveries is the recognition of the vast difference in the abilities of perfectly colorless and invisible gases and vapors to absorb and transmit radiant heat. His measurements confirmed the significance of the greenhouse effect, which was later hypothesized in 1824 by Joseph Fourier. We're lucky to have today's Tyndall lecturer, Professor James Roger Fleming, who joins an august list of past speakers. In 2014, we had Kelly Redmond, who provided a detailed and stimulating perspective on accelerating changes in the Earth system. In 2015, we had Julie Brigham Grete, who discussed the bipolar superinterglacials. And last year, we had Walid Abdalati, who discussed Earth from Space, the Power of Perspective. A bit about our speaker today. Jim Fleming is the Charles A. Dana Professor of Science, Technology, and Society at Colby College and a research associate at the Smithsonian Institution. He, is, uh, he earned his bachelor's degree in astronomy from Penn State University, his master's degree in atmospheric sciences from Colorado State University, and his, his PhD in history from Princeton University. His teaching bridges the sciences and the humanities, and his research interests involve the history of geophysical sciences, especially meteorology and climate change. He has written extensively on the history of weather, climate, technology, and the environment, including social, cultural, and intellectual aspects. His many interesting books include, and I like the titles, <laughs> Meteorology in America, 1800 to 1870, Historical Perspectives on Climate Change, uh, The Calendar Effect, and Fixing the Sky, Another one is Inventing Atmospheric Science. Very interesting books. Jim is a fellow of both the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Meteorological Society. Uh, Jim is a resident of China, Maine. That is the city of China in the state of Maine. Not to be confused by mainland China. <laughs> he enjoys fishing, good jazz, good barbecue. He's in the right city. And he's seeing his students flourish and building a community of historians of the geosciences. I took this quote from his website. Nothing is really work unless you would rather be doing something else. And we're also lucky. Without much ado, I'll welcome Jim. Cool. I guess we start the time. Thank you, Ellie, and, and, and welcome, friends and colleagues. Uh, it's a real honor to be here to, uh, I think my slide just moved, to um, honor John Tyndall. And it's really special to me to be part of the Tyndall Lecture Series. Uh, this is a picture of John Tyndall in 1859, or at least it's a sketch of him, uh, the year that he was experimenting on uh, carbon dioxide and other gases in his laboratory apparatus. I just want to spend a moment honoring his work because uh, it's no news to this group, but he did work on a, a perfectly unexplored field of inquiry, as he announced it in 1859. He was a, a fantastic lecturer. And imagine if you were a graduate student working with a professor and you proposed a topic, and uh, the response was, well, that's a perfectly unexplored topic to work on. Uh, he worked on elementary gases in his tube, uh, but he showed that they were almost transparent to what he called radiant heat. And then he worked on more complex molecules, the ozone, the water vapor, the carbon dioxide, and even hydrocarbons. And he showed that they were the active agents in absorbing more heat than the whole rest of the atmosphere itself. Now, this was fundamental laboratory work at the Rowe Institution from 1859 through the 1860s. A picture of his laboratory apparatus used for scrubbing different gases. The key parts of it are still in existence at the Royal Institution. They're on display on Albemarle Street in London. And uh, the tube is a, 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 a 
a place where you could put different kinds of gases and you could watch the infrared signal that comes through it uh, as you add different kinds of elements to the, to the tube. And so he worked on that and he, he speculated, but never worked directly on climate change, but he speculated that the, the trace gases were sort of a, uh, a, a local dam that would deepen the uh, heat capacity of the atmosphere and they would allow the atmosphere to accumulate heat at the surface of the Earth. <clears throat> and then he also speculated that changes in any of these variables could have led to the mutations of climate, which were just then being discovered by glacial geologists, the so-called ice ages and interglacials. Uh, his work actually set up uh, the puzzle for Svante Arrhenius to follow up on, to work on the CO2 model that he did in the, uh, in the end of the 19th century. With that kind of introduction, uh, I'm not going to talk about Tyndall much more. I just wanted to honor him because this is the Tyndall lecture. You've had earlier speakers who talked exclusively about Tyndall. But I would like to talk about dynamics. I'd like to talk about the topic announced, Gordian Knots of Prevision, the Lessons of History. And this is pretty wide ranging, but it, it basically covers fluid dynamics, technological dynamics, and some very dynamic personalities who take us through the 20th century uh, right to the uh, 1960s, uh, per se, and uh, f featuring the, uh, the efforts of Wilhelm Bjerknes, uh, Carl Gustav Rossby, Harry Wexler, and Ed Lorenz. And their influence uh, as seen through the three horizons of transformative 20th century technologies, that is, the radio, the aerospace, and the nuclear age. Uh, the 20th century it's pretty much the electromagnetic century. It's the, it's the century where we began to produce electromagnetic waves rather than just experience them passively from the environment. It's also, also the beginning of the 20th century when the Wright brothers got off the ground, when heavier than air flight led to uh, eventually commercial flight, military flight, and to air, the aerospace technologies that we see on display in the, in the uh, exhibit hall. And it's also the nuclear century where there was a pre-nuclear age before the bomb, but there's a big influence of nuclear tracers on the ability to trace uh, the winds around the globe and, and see the trajectories of, uh, of particles around the planet. And so uh, this is from the dawn of, of applied fluid dynamics into the emergence of the chaos moment, which is just at 1960 and beyond. The Gordian Knot, I mean, this is part of a classic story of Alexander the Great, According to legend, who found a chariot, a, a wagon that he wanted to use for his campaign, but it was tied by a Gordian knot. It was, untang it was not untieable. It was not uh, untanglable. And so uh, the oracle declared that anyone who could unravel the Gordian knot would be ruler of all of Asia. So the Gordian knot refers to an intractable problem, and cutting the Gordian knot is Alexander's solution. The knot incredibly complex, kind of like what I tie when I try to get the boat tied up, but, uh, and I have to try to figure out how to untie it. But the solution for Alexander was to cut through it. So he drew his sword and solved the Gordian knot with the technology of sharp steel. I'm going to apply this to the history of fluid mechanics and technologies as they come through the 20th century. So we define the Gordian knot of meteorology as the intertwined, intractable tangle of observational imprecision, theoretical uncertainties, and nonlinear influences that, if unraveled, would be the key to perfect provision of the weather for, say, 10 days, for the seasonal conditions for the next year, and for climatic conditions for a decade or longer, or as we heard recently through the 21st century. This is our Gordian knot, and this is what we're trying to untangle, or perhaps, at best, we can use the Alexandrian solutions. I want to start with uh, Pierre-Simon uh, Marquis de Laplace, uh, who basically had, the, the, as we know, the, the Laplacian determinist position that given the position of every uh, particle, if there was an intelligence, say a Laplacian demon, who knew every position of everything in the universe, and, he, and Laplace knew the laws of physics, then Laplace claimed he could calculate the future position of every part particle. This, the formula would apply to the greatest bodies of the universe and the lightest atoms, 
nothing would be uncertain, and the future, like the past, would be, would be present to the eyes of this Laplacian demon. This is an incredibly aggressive program that we found out again in the previous lecture that we are still far short of perfect provision of what will be the future of our systems. Laplace was uh, severely challenged by a later 19th century person. Laplace lived at the time of Napoleon. He apparently told Napoleon this story that he could calculate the universe given the, the positions and the, and the laws. But Henri Poincaré uh, in the 1880s you worked on the three-body problem, and Poincaré was known for uh, looking at the, what's called the sensitivity to initial conditions. He actually used that phrase, that small differences in the initial conditions produce very great ones in the final phenomena. This is, this is Poincaré, and uh, it's recognized as one of the canons today of chaos theory, and Ed Lorenz, who I will finish the lecture with, refers back to Poincaré as one of his inspirations and one of his predecessors. I might as well pause right now to tell sort of my joke. Uh, the difference between Euler and uh, Lagrange. And apparently uh, in St. Petersburg every year Euler would give his big series of lectures to his students and tell them all about the Eulerian system of analysis. And at the end of the lectures would take them out on the bridge on the Neva River and tear up a page of his lecture notes and drop them in the river and say, now students see from this point of view, you can see where the particles are going and now you know the equations that will guide you to understand their movements. Well, on one occasion, Lagrange was out there with, this, this is ap 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 apocryphal but true, basically, story. Uh, Lagrange is out there with him that one, <laughs> one night and uh, just jumps in the river and is going down the river with the particles. And around the bend, they heard Lagrange shouting back to the students on the bridge, go with the flow. And that's the uh, fundamental difference between Olarian and Lagrangian systems. But, but this, this uh, appreciation of uh, numerical analysis applied to, uh, to uh, fluid dynamics, in this case, to all dynamics, uh, made a big uh, impression on Wilhelm Bjerknes. And he's one of the main protagonists in the story I'm going to tell you, because Bjerknes was a student of uh, Poincaré. He also studied with Hertz. He was on a trajectory to become an uh, electromagnetic physicist at the time of the wireless revolution in, in the early 20th century. And he decided to work instead on uh, fluid mechanics and applied to atmospheric forecasting. So he, he's one of the actors who developed the laws of uh, motion that uh, inform our understanding of atmospheric predictability. His student was Carl Gustav Rossby, who carries the story on. Uh, Rossby studied with uh, Birkness for a year in Bergen and worked together with, with Birkness before he went to um, the US and was not directly a, an acolyte of the Bergen School, but had his own vision of moving into the upper atmosphere and working on a uh, frictionless area surface uh, in the imaginary uh, layer at, at say 500 hectopascals and de developing the equations for a simplified flow in the upper atmosphere. Rossby's student at MIT was Harry Wexler and he carries the story into the later 20th century. Three generations of students working together, three generations working on the issue of provision but mod modified in their uh, abilities by the different generations of technology that was coming available to them. Birkner's Neo, I call it the Neo-Laplacian program because it's not purely Laplacian. In 1904, he set it out in the Meteorologische Zeitschrift that the basic uh, uh, needs of meteorology to make it a question of, of physics. He said, we need a sufficiently accurate knowledge of the state of the atmosphere at that initial time. He called that diagnosis diagnose the state of the atmosphere through measurements. Secondly, he needed a sufficiently accurate knowledge of the laws according to which the state of the atmosphere would develop into another. He called that prognosis. Now, in the journal, the word sufficiently is not italicized, but when I read it, it sort of leaped out at me that this was the message of Poincaré coming through, that you could never get a precise weather forecast out of imprecise measurements or you could never solve everything exactly for the future of 
you know, which moment in time and which locale the rain would begin. But you could do a sufficiently accurate job with the, with the kind of program that Birkness was promote, promoting. So he's, he's largely seen as sort of the grandfather of the Bergen School, the grandfather of, of, the, of the fronts and air mass kind of analysis that we have uh, today. But his passion was in fluid mechanics and developing this into a precise, calculable program that would eventually reach fruition. He, he didn't have the, uh, the hubris to think that he could get it done in his lifetime. He thought, these equations are too complex and the weather changes too fast for me, but I'll get a start at it. I'll set out the problem and I'll let others work on it as well. One way he did it was to come into uh, the US. He visited the uh, Columbia University in 1905 after he had published this uh, proposal. And he took the US weather map. This was pretty much a static representation of winds and, and temperatures around the country in, a, in the US weather system. And he took the, the available weather maps and he put them into a relationship by drawing streamlines onto that weather map. So he took a static map and he made it dynamic showing that the winds were converging, let's say in this case, converging strongly around Minneapolis, and that something was happening there with the flow coming together. This was the age as well of, uh, of uh, dir dirigible flight, and so he was talking in his lecture about how a dirigible crossing the country would not go straight, say, from Denver to Minneapolis, but would want to go a little bit south, perhaps, and catch the flow and come into the airport uh, aerodrome in a better uh, way. This was a very practical application for Birkness, not just a theoretical aspect. Birkness gave two major lectures throughout his life, two public lectures. One was how the atmosphere works, and the other was why airplanes fly. And so he was into aerodynamics and into the flow of, of uh, large-scale geophysical flows, but he was also into the fl flow over an air airfoil and how that might be applied to mechanical flight. This was uh, two years after the Wright brothers, and he used to, he, he used to throw little uh, paper airplanes to the audience and show them how the different aerodynamics would be working. <laughs> also, of course, he's well known, and uh, rightly so, as the founder of the Bergen School, as he moved from Germany uh, during World War I into uh, neutral Norway, and began his work for the, for the uh, state-supported uh, Western Norway Weather Service. Uh, he, had a, he had lost some uh, assistance in Germany during the war. He had terrible experiences. He had a, a winter of uh, 1917. Uh, he called the turnip winter, where basically all they had to eat was turnips, and he was losing his students, so he took the opportunity to move to Berg in a small, rainy city on the west coast of Norway but he was able to put together a very dense network along the coast of uh, volunteer observers and uh, trained observers. He even had a pilot who would fly from Bergen to uh, Christiania, which is now Oslo, across the mountains. And they would, uh, they would watch the weather uh, and uh, put together a dense enough network to uh, do the uh, forecasting job that he was going to do, not analytically, but graphically. So the Bergen School can be seen as a graphical calculus. And one of its main components, main ad advocates, uh, Sver Pedersen, wrote a, a, a famous textbook called Weather Analysis and Forecasting. You can't do the forecasting until you do the analysis. And so what's needed is the observations, sufficiently accurate set of observations, and then a set of tools, the analysis, that can show the streamlines. That can sh in this case, it shows the rainy patterns. And they're trying to look at pressure tendencies, and there's a real graphical calculus that's necessary to do a Bergen School kind of forecast. Tor Bergeron wrote about this in 1959, and I recommend that work that he did in the Rossby Memorial volume, putting together the, the pieces of the, of the Bergen puzzle. So you need observations, you need tools, and then on top of that analysis, you apply your model. And that was the famous uh, open wave cyclone model, the idea of moving air masses with fronts and with tendencies. The U.S. Weather Bureau at the time and other weather bureaus could tell you where a low pressure system was, but they couldn't tell you where it was moving. They couldn't tell you if it was going to intensify or dissipate. And so it was a, more, like I said, the static version of weather analysis or weather observation, really. But this gave you a dynamics, a sense that 
these fronts should overtake each other, there should be some development, and you could make at least a couple day forecast out of this before the weather actually changed. So it's for the benefit of the Norwegian fishers and for the Norwegian farmers, and it was supported by the state. This is the Bergen School idea of fluid dynamics circa 1919, 1920. While I was doing this research, I ran across a young lady that I thought was incredibly interesting, uh, Anne Louise Beck. She's kind of like the Rossby of, of Berkeley. She, she's a young lady who was getting her degree uh, in, uh, in, geo in geography and went to Bergen on a Scandinavian American fellowship. Rossby came to America on the reverse fellowship, but she worked with Birkness for a year and she translated his most important paper on the circulation theorem. She, she put it into perfect English and had helped Wilhelm publish it. And then she came to America and uh, presented her work to the US Weather Bureau. Her maps were horribly mangled and she was kind of told uh, that it's nice work, but we, we, we really don't uh, want to put that into our forecasting system. We don't have enough observations like you do in Bergen. So the real, what I discovered was that the, the real resistance to the Bergen School was not completely theoretical. It was based on lack of observations across the country. But Beck went back to Berkeley and she did her master's thesis. We have every map that she analyzed for January 1921. So if you put, I've only brought one of them, but if you put these in sequence and animated them, you would get fronts crossing the country using the US weather observations. And you have, uh, I, I had this uh, reanalyzed by a practicing meteorologist. And you have basically a, a weather front here, wind shear across here, and, it's, and a, a warm front up here with a secondary front developing behind it. And so th this is in false color because she wrote on white on a blue, blue architect's paper, draftsman's paper. So um, we have all, all the, anybody interested, I'd like to generate some new projects here. Anybody interested could look at Bergen School in America circa 1921, at least for the month of January, if you'd like to. The monthly weather review took her maps and horribly mangled them. They moved the front out to the west, they curved it around in Nebraska, and they have no uh, cold air advection, nothing going on in here, and basically they, that's just what they published. And they said, well, anybody interested can go see Ms. Beck for the rest of the maps. And that was kind of the end of it. That was 1921. It was at least 20 years later that the Bergen School, under great, with great effort, caught on in America. But th here's an early example of, a, of, a, of sort of the female Rossby who had the edge and, and yet was not able to do it, partly because of, uh, of gender uh, discrimination at the time. I'm going to move back to the, to the mainstream of Rossby's, uh, of, of uh, Birkness's student, Rossby, because Rossby came to the Weather Bureau and was basically not so welcome either, although he did try a very interesting technique, the rotating wave tank, which is to take the complex atmosphere, uh, work at an upper level, like I said, with no friction, with no water vapor, with no daily heating signal, and to basically flatten it, sort of, sort of turn it into a, into a flat piece of paper rather than a curved globe, and work on this beta plane in the upper atmosphere. The rotating tank with heating on the outside and cold ice in the middle and a, a certain rotation speed was meant to generate the kind of waves that you would see coming across the, uh, the world, and, and they, there was, these are called Rossby waves now, five, five or so in a, in a given uh, cycle. This is what you would see if you're looking down from the top, planetary waves, in this case, five uh, troughs circ circ circling the North Pole. Rossby uh, developed, he was an incredible institution builder, he developed the MIT program, he developed the Chicago program, and then he moved back to Sweden right after World War II to develop the Stockholm International Institute of Meteorology on purpose to reunite the divisions caused by World War II, to bring back the Eastern Europeans, to, to bring the Germans back in conversation using neutral Sweden as a place for these conversations. So the IMI, he moved from, in a way, he moved from dynamics on towards uh, global environmental change. He worked on carbon dioxide, and the big, big problems of the biosphere. He's very happy. This is John T. Carl Gustav uh, having a great time in Stockholm. Personal photograph from Harry Wexler. 
here, here he is with Bert Bolin. This symbolizes his final student, Bert Bolin, the first uh, chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and Rusby's last student in Rome. And they're talking about big environmental problems of the 1950s. I recommend you go back to uh, journals like TELUS and look at the early versions. They're online. And you can see some of their work on carbon dioxide and climate with, on acid rain and on using uh, seawater as, as uh, tracers as it comes through the rain cycle. Very interesting chemical work. Here is Rossby and, uh, and Harry Wexler on the ship at uh, Woods Hole at, at the dock, 1956. And th he was uh, one of Rossby's good students, not, not necessarily the best student, but the one that got best placed as the head of research in the US Weather Bureau. And so I used Harry Wexler to carry the technology story forward. Rossby makes the cover of Time. This is 1956 and uh, it becomes quite famous in his own way, in his own time. He's a celebrity meteorologist of the 1950s. And Wexler gets a visit from Life magazine, and so they make a feature story about Harry. This is at the time when Tyros satellite went up, and he was quite celebrated there as the chief scientist for Tyros. Now, I haven't talked much about technology, except I said it was the electromagnetic century. In 1900, Marconi bridged the Atlantic with, with uh, radio waves, long wave radio, uh, wireless, basically wireless. Within a year, the US Weather Bureau had hired a wireless specialist, uh, RF Fessenden. Uh, Wright Brothers got off the ground, and that was the beginning of uh, basically military interest in aviation, airmail, and uh, eventually uh, commercial flights and the bomb. This is another landmark technology that we can only find in the, in the middle of the 20th century because it generated the nuclear tracers that would lead to uh, tra tracing the upper air winds. Descendants of these uh, technologies include the miniaturization of radio. This is an important stage of uh, ra the, launching the radio sound. This is about 1936. This is about the time that Wexler began his career and it's actually a picture of the, kind of one of the origin stories of remote sensing. You wouldn't have the satellite age unless you had the radio age. You, you couldn't get the signals back from outer space. And uh, there's no evidence that they ever tried this, but if you run a, 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 a line from a satellite and it's orbiting the Earth, it tends to get tangled around the world. So the, the remote sensing using radio, uh, and uh, immediately a new a uh, challenge came up as they needed to t teach electronics as well as meteorology. The other per person in this picture is, is in a, a radio receiver cage and they have to teach meteorologists now at places like MIT. They had to make an agreement with the electrical engineering group to get uh, radio into their uh, weather reports. Uh, this is uh, a plane, the kind of plane that Harry Wexler flew into a hurricane in 1945. This is much uh, advanced uh, air, uh, aviation compared to the Wright Flyer, and uh, and this is uh, Lester Makta's analysis of the of the Russian bomb test and the trajectories that came from uh, uh, the Russian co uh, c country across the Soviet Union, across the Pacific, and across Canada. These are trajectories that were not visible before they had the radioactive tracers. Uh, again, I'm just dealing with technological revolutions. Uh, Harry Wexler's brother's picture, his personal picture of a, a radar screen, circa World War II, showing a front off the coast of New Jersey. This was taken from the signal office uh, outfit there. And uh, Wexler on the left with Johnny von Neumann and Jewel Charney on the right and a, a number of, of other people with the ENIAC computer. Actually, the computer with its vacuum tubes is a descendant of the radio. And so the radio tubes form an on-off logic circuit. Now we use transistors and other things. But this was a, a, a grown-up grandchild of, of, uh, of radio that allowed for the computation of, of these uh, sets of equations that people like Rossby had put together. And then uh, the captured V2s. It turns out that Wexler was in charge of the captured V2 program. So the space age, not, not only the the, uh, the space age began in 1946 or so when we got the captured V2s. So not only did the remote sensing age begin with 36, but the space age begins with these two-stage V2s with a sounding rocket on top for the second stage. Uh, 
and uh, could lead to photographs from outer space. And then I said already, Wexler was the chief scientist for the, for the uh, Tyros program. So we go from uh, basically surface observations to outer space in 60 years. Uh, here's Wexler again with a life photographer. That his daughter told me that, oh, that's my old bedroom. That's where dad was up there with a the life photographer taking a look, kind of like Sherlock Holmes with the uh, magnifying glass. He's looking at uh, very crude uh, Tyros satellite photographs compared to a kind of a Bergen style analysis of what might have been happening at the time. So trying to connect the theory that had been de developed through Bjerknes and the Bergen School with the new technologies of photography from outer space. Uh, here's Harry Wexler in uh, the White House. There's a couple unidentified people in the foreground, but we know that Harry's in the background. Uh, he is a, uh, he's not one of the best and the brightest, as Halberstam would have called it, but Harry is an advisor to the best and the brightest, telling the cabinet members like, like Mac, Robert McNamara here about certain things that the Soviets might be able to do because he's in charge of these uh, space technologies. He also gets sent to Geneva to negotiate the World Weather Watch. So the thing you know is www is not a web address, but it's the World Weather Watch of 1962 put into action in 1963, and he's negotiating here with his Soviet counterpart, Bugayev. Um, so these are, these are important people. These are dynamic people. These are people that you could tell stories about, but they also carry the story of a, of a program to develop atmospheric dynamics into atmospheric forecasting, weather forecasting per se, and to give that kind of ability and technologies to the world. The World Weather Watch was a humanitarian effort to do something beside blow each other up in the Cold War. This was a U.S.-Soviet bilateral effort to share weather satellite technologies and to, to allow for the World Meteorological Agency to develop forecasting for the rest of the world. Rossby, in 1956, got on a committee of the National Academy called the Committee on Meteorology. And he said, well, I think we should call this the Committee on Atmospheric Science because there's so many new sciences coming in. There's mathematicians and there's people like Edward Teller were joining the Committee on, uh, on Nuclear Issues. Uh, there are chemical, ch chemists were needed. There were issues about the ozone hole and depletion in the 60s, way before the current concern. And so Rossby was talking about technology cutting the Gordian knot. He, he sort of made an Alexandrian comment to the Academy and said, we're cutting into this thing, but we're not, we're not solving the intractability of it. The radio family, as I said, gave us upper air observation through radio sounds, gave us remote imaging through radar, and gave us the uh, operational numerical weather prediction and the general circulation models from computing. The aerospace family, uh, driven by commercial and military uh, needs, uh, it's a very big century for increasing support and money coming into the atmospheric sciences. The biggest surge of money comes in 1958 after Sputnik, after Lloyd Bjerkner talks about the needs of atmospheric science and the scale that's needed to keep up with the Soviets. But here you can trace that family through airplanes, rockets, and satellites. And so I'm not the kind of historian that would look at the technology behind the actual building of Tyros, but I would look at the horizon that Tyros brought for the rest of the atmospheric sciences. The nuclear family, then I already mentioned, is radioactive, radioactive tracers. So if you look at the term atmosphere, you can imagine a kind of a, what I like to call a shape-shifting noun. The atmosphere for Bjerknes was pretty much surface observations at, taken at, uh, at, near, at or near the surface, perhaps by looking at the clouds and by working within the first uh, few uh, thousand meters or so. For Rossby, it was the middle atmosphere. It was the middle troposphere using radio sons and the MIT airplane and ability to get some data from, uh, say, the 500 hectopascal layer, about halfway up in pressure. For Wexler, it was getting the satellite there and looking down. He, Wexler wasn't even con convinced initially that satellites could be a meteorological instrument. They were flying above the weather. They were looking down on the weather. And so there's a really wonderful story of Arthur C. Clarke, the famous uh, science fiction writer and futurist, asking Harry to speak at the, uh, at the uh, Haydn Planetarium Symposium. It was 1954, and Harry put together a talk about the use of the satellite as a meteorological 
instrument and looking at what the earth might look like. He had an artist uh, commission the painting of what the earth might look like from about 3,000 miles above Texas. This painting is hanging in the Nesdis satellite office in Washington, D.C. It's framed. Uh, they, don't, they didn't know what they had, but we, had, we provided a history behind the, the painting of this picture. And now it's space weather from, from here on to the sun and uh, the whole interplanetary atmosphere interacting. So the term atmosphere has an expanding role to play in the 20th century, largely driven by the technologies that allow us to look farther and, and deeper and higher. In 1960, as Tyros came off the launch pad, uh, Wexler wrote with one of his colleagues, John Bellamy, he wrote, the goal of meteorology is to portray everything atmospheric everywhere always. Imagine, this, 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 is your, this is your charge. Uh, we need observation systems. We now have a new decadal survey coming out where perhaps we want to measure everything, everywhere, always. And that's not so bad. That, that takes a lot of infrastructure. But this was the spirit. This, this was the, the kid in the candy store attitude as the time Tyros went up. This was uh, a century of expanding capabilities Radio waves not only gave you a, a remote way to probe the atmosphere, but they gave you a way to communicate your forecast to others. Uh, and all the technologies through aviation gave you a chance to be right together with the events that are happening in, in, the, in the cloud level or above. So they were, there's, uh, I kind of like to talk about uh, the 100 acre wood. And uh, Christopher Robbins here are the people I'm talking about. The people who took the technologies didn't make them. They didn't make satellites. They didn't make radar. But they used it immediately, and they adapted it into their particular frequencies that they would like to use and they would like to write about. Harry had the first paper on radar observations of a hurricane coming across Florida. Very early stuff using the new technologies. And so they're the Christopher Robbins. But you might also have read some stories about the recalcitrant weather bureau and the directors of the Weather Bureau that slowed down people like Miss Ann Beck back in the 1920s. And they were Eeyore, and they couldn't get it done. And that kind of, it depends on what kind of story you want to tell, what kind of sources you wanted to use to get your, uh, your interpretation. But, but definitely for the first, not, now not today, don't take it wrong if, if anybody there is the director of the National Weather Service. But the idea here is that the researchers were really, really excited about what they were getting and what they could do. In the year 1960, Tyros successfully orbited and brought back the pictures from space. But also in the year 1960, there was a big conference in Tokyo on numerical weather prediction, and Ed Lorenz went and talked about his paper, which was uh, the, the precursor to his uh, more, more, more famous published paper on the, uh, on the predictability of the atmosphere. He used a Royal McBee Corporation small computer. Small means a desk-sized computer, not a gigantic ENIAC. He didn't use all the equations that Charney and Rossby had developed, but he used a three-equation model, taking a more complex model and, and condensing it into a, a number of variables that showed chaotic behavior. And we got a nice hum here, so, okay? So something was humming. Feedback. And so, so the Royal McBee developed for, for Lorenz a kind of, a, of an approach that these equations really were interacting and producing uh, the kinds of behavior that uh, was now called chaos, challenging the technological enthusiasm fueled by the recent arrival of the weather satellites and the climate models and the Earth orbiting uh, numerical weather uh, models and effectively ending, I think this is the beginning of the end, maybe not the actual end, it took a while to catch on, but this is the beginning of the end for the, for the uh, neo-Laplacian program. The famous uh, ch uh, div divergence based on slight changes of initial conditions, and it runs uh, pretty well, behaves itself pretty well through day six, and then the red and the blue begin to diverge, and they go their own separate ways. Same equations, slightly different initial conditions, uh, uh, as published by Lorenz. And from his archives, uh, Ed's papers are in the Library of Congress, and uh, he certainly is a, a, a legend in, our, in the, the field of chaos studies. But he said, uh, in solving the forecast problem, 
Uh, you could try to learn to make essentially perfect weather forecasts. Uh, you could learn the, to make the best attainable weather forecasts, even if they're not perfect or far from perfect. You could try to learn how good the best attainable forecasts are, even if we don't learn how to make them, which would be a theoretical problem. And then he asked, why should nearly perfect forecasts be unattainable? His answer was chaos. Now, in, in his papers, uh, there's a packet of transparencies for every lecture he ever gave. And it looks like there's lots and lots and lots of transparencies. And he made a particular lecture for every particular audience he ever spoke to. The new Gordian knot then, as defined by, by Lorenz, is, is based both on the weather uh, being uh, not predictable outside of a chaotic limit, but it's also that climate may be compatible with two different kinds of external conditions, that there could be a kind of a climate attractor that allows you to get a, a kind of a, uh, a, a, an interesting divergent result from the same approach. Uh, this is, this is a, a publication he was working on late in life. He, he, he was calling it Regime Change in a Simple Climate Model. And he was trying to reproduce in a climate model of his own design the jumpiness of the paleo record. Not a smooth projection into the future, but trying to reproduce the set of surprises that come if you look at the paleo climate record. And he, he, he's quoted as saying, a climatologist encountering fluctuations in real data could not, on the basis of the data alone, say whether the dominant cause of the change was external or internal. And that, that moves our focus back toward the internal nature of the chaos theory, away from some uh, overemphasis, uh, I think, on, on forcing factors, because Ed was working what they called chaotic forcing factors, factors that would, like, like CO2, that would bring the climate to, to a a tipping point, but then it, it would be unclear which, which way the climate would tip. And this is echoed in the third assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel. In climate research and modeling, we should recognize we are dealing with a coupled nonlinear chaotic system, and therefore the long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible. The most we can expect to achieve is the prediction of the probability distribution of the system's future possible states by the generation of ensembles of model solutions. This was only published once out of all the IPCC reports. This particular quote did not make it to the summary for policymakers. And I don't think it's in our collective large scale consciousness that we are facing a chaotic system with the climate, as well as, uh, as the challenge that it presents to things like ensemble modeling and the, the kind of the approach to, uh, to, to reducing uncertainty. I'd like to summarize a bit. I've taken you on a long ride from Wilhelm Bjerknes in the 1900s, say, to 1960. Uh, there's certainly developments since then, but uh, that, that's for another story. Uh, Bjerknes, Rossby, and Wexler were, and Lorenz were public-minded builders. They were what I like to call entrepreneurs, not entrepreneurs. They didn't make a fortune, but they made teams, and they, they brought us some of the best people that we can think about in, in the field of atmospheric science. They brought us people like Tor Bergeron, Jakob Bjerknes, uh, uh, Rossby nurtured people like Jewel Charney. Uh, there's a celebration of the 100th anniversary of Charney and Lorenz being held at MIT in February, and they're both reaching their 100th year anniversary of their birth. And both of them were these sort of scientific entrepreneurs, which has a bigger bigger connotation than, uh, than simply gaining their own market share. They were risk takers with grand visions of what the science needed, and they were riding the new ways of technology that gave every generation a new sort of lease on atmospheric se sensing. They and their many college brought, the colleagues, they brought meteorology into the information age, into the space age, and into the nuclear age. And those are things that weren't in existence when Laplace was writing. Uh, Bjerknes was not a failed physicist. You might read some stories about him where he left uh, uh, electromagnetic theory and decided to take second-rate second atmospheric science as his field. But he was actually very deeply involved in the complexity of fluid dynamics, moving from studying ideal fluids, which Helmholtz had done, into studying real fluids, which was a quite difficult problem because of all the different changes the fluids can experience. Rossby, as I said, was very much his own man. 
He was not a simple accolade of the Bergen uh, School, and he was a formidable theorist, an institution builder who brought the abstraction into the upper atmosphere. And it was a really inspiring moment for atmospheric science because they thought if we can solve the key to Rossby waves, we can solve the key to long-range forecasting. We can derive the surface weather from the upper air conditions, which is exactly what the ENIAC computations were doing. They were computing upper air conditions in the first numerical forecast, and then you could in intuit what the, what the surface conditions might be. This was a really heady moment for atmospheric science. So here's Wexler as an entrepreneur working through the Weather Bureau, but in charge of all the new technologies. He had his own uh, portfolio of radio, radar, nuclear tracers, rockets, digital computing, and weather satellites, and the World Weather Watch diplomatically. He died at age 51, and somebody asked me, what would you say to Harry if you could talk to him? I'd say, Harry, slow down, smell the roses, take a break. But he has a gigantic portfolio of all these new things on his desk, trying to bring atmospheric science into communication with them. Uh, Poincaré had, as I said, had placed serious constraints on the Laplacian program and, and, and the ability to untie it because you can't solve a three-body problem. How can you solve precisely a 27 million body problem? But, and then Lorenz gave us this new knot of, of the new knot of chaos. The technologies have sliced the knotty problems. They've, they've generated some new ones, like how do you train meteorologists in electrical engineering? They've, they've generated new problems, new little knots as we go, but the big knot uh, remains in need of new unraveling approaches, I think, and it remains in, in need of new Alexandrian solutions. Atmospheric science, I would claim, is still coming to terms with that because we had, circa 1960, we had computers, we had satellites, and we had other approaches. We still have those technologies. What's the new breakthrough in atmospheric science that'll give the new life to this, to this challenge? So was Bjerknes right? Yes. Uh, uh, you, if you had a sufficiently accurate measurement and a sufficiently accurate knowledge, you can make a useful forecast, which is what exactly we've been doing for the, for the previous century. But I'd like to propose a new uh, uh, idea that continuous, technologically enhanced real-time measurements and monitoring of the atmosphere and oceans at every scale, sufficient to provide feedback and diagnostics for improved models. This is what we need, and this is what we're asking you know, for through, through uh, our, our measurement program through our interaction between models and measurements, and then through our analysis of the, of, the, of the results, not in terms of prediction. I hear the word prediction too often in relation to climate, but in these projections and in these possibilities of where the system might be headed. So history matters. I hope I honored John Tyndall by arguing that this 20th century history matters, and I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Uh, step up to the mic. Very excellent talk, Dr. Fleming. I really appreciate it. It's a very good, excellent talk. I'm really glad you gave that. Um, I myself have been very, very fortunate to have my own oral history collected and published on the American Institute of Physics uh, website. Uh, can you tell us if many of these people, has, has Wexler or Bjorknes or Rossby or Charney, were, were they in their lifetime ever to be uh, interviewed and have their oral histories recorded? And uh, if so, where are they available? Okay, thank you. Uh, the question, uh, I guess you all heard the question. Charney has been interviewed. There's a uh, a book called Conversations with Jewel Charney. It's very revealing, and George Platzman uh, sat with him uh, near his, on, on his deathbed, really, and talked to Jewel about his experiences, uh, which found many of that, much of that interview found its way into my book, the, uh, the Inventing Atmospheric Science book, which was this lecture was based on. Ed Lorenz has been interviewed, too, and there's uh, uh, a number of his interviews uh, uh, I can't give you chapter and verse of where they're available, but he's certainly been interview interviewed by, uh, by the American Institute of Physics, 
and by, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that citation. Uh, Rossby, um, I don't have a Rossby interview per se. Uh, Rossby was peripatetic. He was always moving. We, we tried uh, desperately to collect his papers. They, they're scattered all over the world. There, there's a cache of his papers in, uh, in um, Stockholm at the Institute. Uh, and and Björkness not, uh, no interviews. Although Jakob has an interview. And, and so th th I'd like to say that this, this project is a really good one to interview uh, distinguished scientists, not, not only not only the, the usual suspects, but get a, get a cross-section of people. And so we're getting a lot more of that now. I'm personally doing uh, little vignettes. I don't, I've done a few interviews myself, but I'd like to do the little video interviews with people who knew these uh, more famous scientists and use that for enhancement. That's a really good project. The AIP does it. The American Meteorological Society does it. And I encourage that kind of practice. Thank you for the question. Jim, Hera Conway, of course, you know nice. me. Um, you raised an interesting question in my mind with your comment about the Gordian knot and the way only the third assessment report even acknowledges the problem um, of multiple possible end states um, from initial conditions. Why do you think that is? Why do you think only the TAR acknowledges that, that fundamental problem of chaos? Excellent question. I saw a uh, copy of EOS a couple years ago. I think it was now about seven years ago. It was called uh, an article called Chaos in Climate Models. And I thought, boy, it's about time they start to acknowledge this. Or, uh, I'm sure that they've looked at it earlier. The, the, the earlier period uh, when they were first building uh, numerical weather, uh, numerical weather uh, models realized that there were uh, equations that would just actually explode if they put, kept everything in the model. And so when you look at Norm Phillips' early circulation model, they were clearly aware that they couldn't put everything in the model because some equations behave, for example, sound waves, they can be, uh, and gravity waves, they can be magnified and overwhelm some of the weather systems things. Why the IPCC uh, decided not to repeat this or not to emphasize it is a really good question. I think it's a research question. I think it's worthy of looking into uh, the different reports, and especially why the third assessment report never got past uh, chapter 14, paragraph 14, into, uh, into the summary for policymakers. And so I'm, I'm bringing to sort of to this, this, this history is in a way inter interfacing with public policy, but asking uh, why does history matter? It's because you can understand some of these perspectives but it hasn't become part of our dominant consciousness. Um, where, where, you know, where will we be in 2100? Who knows? Uh, most of us won't be here. How do you make a forecast which is beyond the future? How do you acknowledge that the system is chaotic? How do you take an account of, of Ed Lorenz's work, not just for the limits of weather prediction, but for the, for the bigger I issues of climate prediction? It's a rhetorical answer, but it's, I think it's an important research pro topic. I'd like to encourage anybody here to, to get involved in it. I think that's it. If no more questions, we'll give another. Thank you very much. Thank you.